so last week we got to know Peter a little bit, and you probably weren't surprised to see Peter mentioned in this again. We talked about his rashness, even compared him to a couple famous Chicagoans. Uh, and in this passage, he's naked, he puts on clothes, and then he jumps into the water. <laughs> so you can see Peter's uh, sort of personality. But if you were a little bit confused while you were reading, while we were reading this Bible reading, if you were wondering, who are we really talking about? You aren't alone. Because today we're not studying any of these disciples listed up here. But rather we are studying a person referred to in the Gospel of John as the beloved disciple. It translates itself out in Greek as, uh, into English from the Greek as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's also considered to be the disciple who's mentioned whenever a disciple is not named. So you'll notice throughout the scripture reading that we often heard the phrase, the other disciple. A couple of other disciples were with Jesus. The disciple whom Jesus loved. He's sort of a mystery. The beloved disciple. And so you see up here uh, that where Jesus had, or the disciple has a question mark where his face should be. There's been all sorts of historical debate. Who is the beloved disciple? Who is John talking about when he says the disciple whom Jesus loved? Who was it? Who was this person who had this special relationship with Jesus? And why don't we know more about him? We know that he was a tax collector. We know Simon Peter was this rash, brute woman. <coughs> we know that Philip, our namesake for the church, was one of the other disciples here who went up and said, come and see. We know Nathaniel, the Israelite. But who was the beloved disciple? It's one of the Bible's mysteries. You might be able to catch a History Channel special on the beloved disciple. So one of the, one of the classical theories is that the beloved disciple is Saint John. And John, of course, is one of, uh, one of the disciples. He's named. He's known throughout church history. He's also known as the disciple who was the first to travel to India. Several churches, uh, you know, many of course, St. John's Lutheran Church, St. John's Catholic Church. And so many people say, well, the beloved disciple had to be John because the gospel is named John. Well, a couple of other theories also involving the name John. St. John, but the beloved disciple could also be John of Patmos. John of Patmos is another John in the Bible, and he wrote the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and the book of Revelation. Another John, another writer, another follower of this special school of Jesus with <coughs> certain rules and regulations. Another theory, another John here on the end. Uh, that John was the person who actually wrote the book, the Gospel of John. And that's why this last line at the end of the scripture reads, this, this is the disciple who has testified to these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. So we've got a few classical options for the beloved disciple. All named John. Very confusing. What else? Who else could be this mysterious beloved disciple? And when we read in, of course, the English at the end here, this is the disciple. We think, okay, if he's saying he's a disciple, he must mean he's one of these original 12, right? Because that's what a disciple is. The later scholars have looked back at the Bible and realized that the word disciple is not meant to be used just to these 12 original followers of Jesus, but that at the time of Jesus and after his death and resurrection, anyone who believed in and followed Jesus was known as a disciple of Christ. That anyone who was invited to be in and be a part of the Christian faith was known as a disciple. Now this is instructive for us because we know that we worship not a historical faith of disciples, that we too are called to be disciples. And it's a broader category than just those 12. So who else? Well, you'll often hear, uh, especially now today, modern day scholars, uh, suggesting that perhaps Lazarus was actually the beloved disciple. You remember the story of Lazarus? This is the famous, shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Lazarus. 
Lazarus was one of Jesus' closest, best friends. And Jesus came to visit him after he had died. And when Jesus heard the news that Lazarus had died, he wept openly, sobbed in front of all his friends, in front of Lazarus, two sisters, Mary and Martha. And out of this weeping came an immense power of resurrection. That Jesus went to Lazarus' tomb and overcome with emotion, he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus gets up. You see him walking out here, an artist's depiction of this. Lazarus, covered in the grave clothes, alive. Lazarus is prophesied to perhaps be the beloved disciple because Jesus says the beloved disciple would never die. And Lazarus has been resurrected close friend of Jesus. So many consider perhaps Lazarus was meant to be the beloved disciple. Well, another final option that people have talked about, who is this mysterious beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved? This disciple was there for all of the important events, for the calls of the disciples. This disciple was there and even outran Peter to the tomb. So we know that whoever this person was, they must have been fast. Mary Magdalene final option for the beloved disciple. Again, one of Jesus' closest companions, one of Jesus' closest friends. And it's imagined that although she was part of this close-knit, tight group of following Jesus, present at the last of her, present at the tomb, she was not originally listed in the 11 disciples uh, because she was a woman. So we've got all these options, all this mystery. Of course, people like looking back and trying to discover who was this beloved disciple. Why does John choose not to refer to this disciple by name, but rather saying the one whom Jesus loved? You can see Jesus' closeness to the beloved disciple in all the ways that Jesus taught this beloved disciple, in ways that he taught us as well. This, the Bible mentions that the beloved disciple was the one who was sitting, who was seated at the left side of Jesus and reclining next to him, perhaps embracing him, hugging him in a moment of fear. And that night when Jesus was betrayed, when Jesus knew that his death was coming, he sat close to the beloved disciple and enriched their bonds and friendship. The beloved disciple also learned from Jesus that God is a God of love. Because this disciple is not defined as Peter by his faith, by his founding of the church, but rather this disciple is not even defined by his name, but by the fact that Jesus loved him or her. Whoever this disciple was, he or she would not be remembered by name, but rather by the fact that they were the disciple whom Jesus loved. And that love, that bond of friendship, was so important that it taught this disciple that God, who sent Jesus to save the world, was not ultimately only a God of power, a God of strength, but a God of love. And the love that Jesus had for this disciple changed the disciple's understanding of who God was. Well, Jesus also taught the beloved disciple of the power and the faith of resurrection. This beloved disciple who came, whether it was Mary Magdalene herself, or whether it was one who came with Mary Magdalene to the tomb, we read that, the, that when Peter first came to the tomb and wasn't sure what was going on, the beloved disciple, as soon as he saw this empty tomb, he didn't need to see the resurrected body of Jesus. He didn't need to insert his fingers into the, into the wounds of Jesus, as Thomas did. But rather, the, the beloved disciple saw and believed. His faith was enhanced by the love that Jesus had for him. The beloved disciple not only saw the power and believed in the power of Jesus' resurrection, but also was invited, was taught by Jesus, that we too are invited into that resurrection. We learn and we lift up in church every single week the power of eternal life that Jesus has set aside for us. And what does Jesus say about the beloved disciple? He said that if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? 
follow me. And the other disciples understood that this disciple would never die. What that means, of course, is that we too are invited into eternal life. That because of the power and the promise of Jesus' love for this disciple, he too was invited into resurrection. The promise was not just for Lazarus. The promise was not just that Lazarus would be brought back to life after being, after being killed by this terrible illness, but that he would be given life eternal. Last Sunday, and to get some important time. All right. So we talked last week that you know a beloved disciple, and I think we saw photos of uh, Mike Dicka and Kanye West. Uh, or do you know the disciple? Peter. And now, do you know a beloved disciple? Carol, I bet you never thought everybody would get to see this lovely picture of you on Santa Flat. <laughs> <laughs> do you know a beloved disciple? I talked earlier about how the story of the beloved disciple, the fact that he's not given a particular name, a particular place, a particular occupation. What John is trying to do here, by not specifically identifying the beloved disciple, is inviting all of us to recognize the beloved disciples around us. That the disciples are not just confined to these 12 men who lived in first century Jerusalem, but that to be a beloved disciple is to be loved by Jesus. And so you see here a few examples of beloved disciples in our own midst. And not just up above, but if you look at one another. Jesus has chosen each and every person here to be a beloved disciple. And so if you are a part of a community of faith, a part of a family, a part of a friendship, then you know a beloved disciple. See, that's the wonderful thing, and that's why I chose the beloved disciple for this week. Because the beloved disciple is not just a history lesson on who the disciples were, but on who the disciples today are in their youth. And so if you look in the mirror this morning, you wonder who the disciples were, and you try and figure out this mystery. Who was the beloved disciple? Was it Lazarus? Was it Mary Magdalene? Was it John? One of the three Johns. You look in the mirror and know that you are a beloved disciple. And the reason that John wrote his gospel this way, that he included a disciple whom Jesus loved and did not name him, and said that he would live forever, was that so all those who were reading John's gospel 2,015 years later, would themselves identify with the beloved disciple. The beloved disciple is each and every one of you. And as I prepare to leave today, that's what I want to thank each and every one of you for, and what I want to thank Jesus for. That Jesus has shown us here that what holds us together as a church community is not uh, earthly leadership, is not a successful budget, even though Jack has done an incredible job. But what holds us together as a faith community is love. And if we recognize one another, not just as people we know in church, not just as friends we've maybe had for 40 years or one year, but rather, we recognize in one another that we are beloved disciples of Jesus together. And that what defines us as disciples is Jesus' love for us, and not only that, but our love for one another. Then that's what enables us to live into the promises that Jesus has given the disciples and that Jesus has given us as his disciples. It is that love that I will carry with me as I leave from each and every one of you. The love of Jesus that comes down and goes out among each and every one of us. 
And we have all these disciples, all these stories, these 12 stories, the tax collector, the one who would betray Jesus, and sometimes it comes across like a history lesson. But then John reminds us that there's another disciple, a beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And in those moments of darkness, of death, of fear, of pain, for your parents, for your children, for your siblings, of uncertainty, of job loss, of new life transition. Remember that what defines us is God's love for us. And maybe you're more like Peter, maybe you're loud and outspoken, maybe you're more like Matthew, ashamed, quiet. But whatever disciple you're like, you are most clearly identified as the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And above all, what I'll take with me from this place is love, the love I have for you, and the love that you had for me, and the love that we together have had for Jesus. So what do we take with us? What does the beloved disciple, this mysterious, enigmatic figure, what does the beloved disciple teach us? First off, to be loved. To open our hearts, to open our minds to a God that doesn't want to first punish us, that doesn't want to first make us ashamed, but first invites us to be loved. And as we receive that immense love from our Father in heaven, then the beloved disciple reminds us to love one another. That that same love that Jesus has for us, it stops with us. It stays within us unless we love one another. And when we love one another, we start to see Jesus' love spread. Jesus can love us individually, but only we can love one another as a community and create a community out of that love. And finally, the beloved disciple teaches us and reminds us to be defined not by death, to be defined not by the tomb, by the illness that befell Lazarus, by the illness, by the pain that's in your life today, but rather to be defined as individuals and as a church by the promise of everlasting life. We don't know the name of the beloved disciple. We don't know where he or she is from, what they did for a living. But what we do know is that Jesus said the beloved disciple would never die. The beloved disciple was called to live according to that promise. That there was nothing in all creation, not even death, that would keep him from the love of God that exists in Christ Jesus. And there's nothing in all creation, not even death, that can keep us from the love of God that is ours through Christ Jesus. And when we live our lives defined by that promise, then we live our lives according to hope. Then our church is defined by hope. Our church is defined by everlasting life. And there is not the fear that crippled us, that holds us back, but rather the hope that urges us forward into new opportunities, new life, even in the face of death, and even in the face of departure. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for the beloved disciple, for the things in our lives that seem like mysteries, that seem unknown, and then lead us to uncover new secrets, new hope, and new love. We ask that we in our lives might be open to your love might be free to love one another, and might be by, defined by the promise of life and not by the death and suffering that is also part of our lives. In your name we pray.